About six months ago, I posted a video about temperature measurement of distillation columns. A few months later, and a little wiser, I've had a number of failures traced back to my bad design choices, so I thought I'd better take down the original video in case anyone else makes the same mistakes and post an updated version. To operate a continuous distillation column requires precise control of heat and wash flow. I add heat as steam, so control the rate of steam flow. I found that this requires continuous adjustment of steam flow rate to allow for varying ambient temperature, atmospheric pressure and the slow drift that occurs over days in pump flow rates. These adjustments are made in response to changes in measured parameters. The ideal parameters would be constant measurement of product and bottoms alcohol content, but that is difficult and expensive to do. So instead I have used column temperatures as surrogate parameters. I have worked on two such parameters, the temperature of the bottom of the column which reflects the alcohol content of the bottoms, and the length of the isothermal section of the column. In a spirit column with 20 plus stages, the temperatures of the top 16 or so stages are going to be close together and close to 78 degrees, giving a temperature profile rather like this. You can measure that profile by placing multiple temperature sensors spaced evenly along the column surface. Inexpensive temperature measurement systems are not precise enough for those temperatures to be used as control parameters, but the bottom few stages run hotter at between 78 and 100 degrees. The sensors I use are generally precise to within about a degree and so enable reliable determination of where the transition between this lower section of the column and the higher isothermal section is. The length of that isothermal section is a parameter that can be used to control the column. I have found that if the column is uninsulated then spirit proof is slightly higher because of increased reflux, but there is a greater temperature differential between the centre of the column and the surface thermometers. I found this to be 2 to 3 degrees with a 28mm diameter column. I have used the DS18B20 one wire temperature sensor. This is an electronic chip from Dallas Semiconductor. It contains a temperature sensor, an analog to digital converter to digitize the temperature, and electronics to send that temperature as a digital signal to a receiving computer. They are sold in two forms the chip packaged in a plastic three wire case like this, and a waterproof version where that package is contained within a stainless steel cylinder like this. I use the plastic package because it's smaller and less expensive. The protocol for reading the temperature is complicated and by electronic standards it's quite slow, but that hardly matters for a sensor that responds to relatively slow temperature changes. The three pins are ground, data and power supply. Any number can be wired up in parallel so that all data pins, power pins and ground pins are connected together. The first thing to do is to glue the temperature sensors along the column with an epoxy that is tolerant of high temperatures. I use milliput, which is good to about 130 degrees centigrade, but there are many other epoxy adhesives and putties that will do. I found it easier to glue the sensors on first and wire them up afterwards, connecting them like this with a pull-up resistor to a 3.3 volt power supply rail. You then need two wires to connect to the Raspberry Pi, one to ground and the other is the data line. Each sensor has a unique serial number. The temperature read protocol starts with the computer sending out a reset signal on the data line. Any sensor connected then responds with a present signal so the computer knows at least one sensor is connected. There then follows a fairly complicated exchange in which the computer determines the serial numbers of all sensors on the line. The computer then sends a read signal addressed to one of the connected sensors which replies with its temperature reading. The computer repeats this for all sensors. The system is called one wire because it can work with only the ground and data lines connected. The power line is optional. When the power line is not connected, the chips draw their power from the data line. They contain onboard capacitors which are charged up when the data line is high and then power the chip while it's low. With the Raspberry Pi that works fine for two or three chips but the power distribution on the power is generally pretty marginal. This one wire system can be temperamental so I suggest using the power line and powering them from a source independent of the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi has pins for powering peripheral components that use either 5 or 3.3 volts. The 5 volt line is limited to 250 milliamps and the 3.3 volt to 50. My setup uses 12 volt heaters at the column top and 12 volts to drive the stepper motors. 
with 20 chips connected, supplying power from the Pi did not work reliably. I initially came up with this scheme using a 3.3 volt LM1117 voltage regulator powered by my 12 volt rail to supply juice to the DS18B20s and found that if I pulled up the data line to 5 volts rather than 3.3 volts it worked more reliably and it did work flawlessly for several thousands of hours of operation but then it failed. One of the DS18B20s had shorted the power supply to ground. The LM1117 does not have an overcurrent protection system and so when shorted it will fail and will fail fast with a high dropout voltage such as I was using with a high current 12 volt supply. In this case it failed with an output voltage close to 12 volts and that's probably why a couple of other DS18B20s went down with it. But that's not all. The input transistor on the Raspberry Pi GPIO pin also failed. That pin would work as an output pin but not as an input pin. I didn't have to buy another Raspberry Pi because the one wire system can be reprogrammed to use a different pin. It was only while I was looking into this further that I found the Raspberry Pi GPIO pins are not supposed to be pulled up to over 3.3 volts. So my scheme of pulling the data line up to 5 volts is not recommended but that's not what killed the Pi pin. It was one of the failed DS18B20s pulling up the data line to over 7 volts. Another thing I was careless about is that the tab on the LM1117 that you solder to a heatsink is not connected to ground but to the output. I had not taken enough precautions to protect it from ground and I fried another one while working out what was going wrong. In the light of that failure I redesigned the system to be less vulnerable. I used an LF33CV voltage regulator which does have overcurrent protection and pull up the data line to 3.3 volts. This has led to somewhat more frequent errors which I've managed using the try command in Python. The current error rate of about 1 in 1000 reads is satisfactory. That's using a 4.7k pull up resistor. I also tried powering the chips from the data line but never got it to work reliably. The Python programming language that comes with the Raspberry Pi has the software necessary to read from one wire devices. I won't go into details as there is abundant information online about how to set up the DS18B20. My only proviso being that the power supply systems they recommend don't work reliably for this many sensors on the Raspberry Pi. When it's all set up, the Raspberry Pi reads data from the temperature sensors and saves it in a series of files. To find these, go to sys-bus-w1-devices and you'll see a list of folders, the names of which correspond to the serial numbers of the temperature sensors. There'll be one folder for each sensor, but the read process is quite slow, so it may take a second or two before they all appear. If you go into one of these folders and open the file to read its contents, you'll see that the temperature is recorded in milli-degrees C. It's not precise to one milli-degree and the resolution of the measurement is 0 0.625 degrees. For more precision it can be calibrated to a known temperature but for our purpose accuracy within one degree is good enough. So in Python you extract data from these files in a repeating loop giving a list of temperatures that is regularly updated. This may not work first time and it didn't for me. Commonly when small board computer systems don't work properly, marginal power supply is the problem. So that is one place to look and is how I came up with my power supply scheme. Now you have to work out which temperature sensor is which, which is quite tedious. You run the Pi to continuously display the temperatures of all sensors and then you warm them one at a time by pressing your thumb on one. You note which one has a rising temperature and label it, then work through the rest. I found it easier to do this once the sensors were glued to the column and connected rather than to identify them first and keep track of them after that. The best description I know of online of how the one wire system works is in Robert Smorgsborg's channel and is linked below. My first fractional distillation columns were 28mm in diameter because I had access to copper pipe of that size. I recently acquired some 35mm diameter copper pipe and used it to build a column. I tried my scheme of multiple temperature sensors mounted on the surface of the column to measure the length of the isothermal section, but this failed as a control parameter. The surface of the column runs cooler than the core. At 28mm the approximation was fair, with the surface temperature within 2-3 to three degrees of the core, but at 35mm the difference was over 5 degrees, which did not allow precise estimation of the bottom of the isothermal section. 
So instead, I use a single DS18B20 at the bottom of the column as a sole control parameter. I initially rejected this scheme because the resolution of the DS18B20 seemed insufficient. Using bottom temperature as a control parameter requires that the temperature be controlled to about 300 milliDegrees below the boiling point of water. The DS18B20 has a resolution of a sixteenth of a degree, so that region of interest is only covered by two or three counts. I described this in more detail in a prior video. Because of what I thought would be insufficient resolution, I developed a system using a Platinum 100 ohm or PT100 sensor, which I'll describe in a future video, but having done that, I have new respect for the DS18B20. Compared to more ambitious systems, they have two major advantages. Firstly, being digital, they are resistant to interference and noise. And secondly, in my experience, they have been extremely stable. The resolution is to a sixteenth of a degree, but the temperature they give is only accurate to be within about one degree. However, in this application, they are calibrated to a temperature close to the temperature of interest. And once calibrated, I found no appreciable drift over several months. I have used one as a sole bottom temperature sensor for controlling the 35mm column. I was not able to achieve over 96% proof, but I was able to achieve over 95% consistently with the bottoms of under 0.2% and a fine tasting product. So despite my reservations, I would certainly recommend it as a place to start with bottom temperature control of larger diameter columns.